Hello, I'm Tim McHenry. At the Rubin Museum of Art, we have the privilege of sharing the ideas and art from the Himalayas with the world. The function of this very particular art form is to guide us on how we can explore our inner world to help us better navigate the outer one. In this onstage brainwave program filmed on December the 2nd, 2022, we looked at what anger does to us and how inseparable it is from all other emotional states. The Vairochana Mandala teachings aim to assist us in recognizing how to translate the potentially destructive energies generated by feelings of anger into mirror-like wisdom, a recognition that if we could only step back from the situation and see it clearly, we could navigate it, causing less harm to others and ourselves. But sometimes, it takes a radical and compassionate act to break the cycle of rage. In the new Oscar-nominated short documentary by Joshua Seftel, Stranger at the Gate, we hear the extraordinary story of Marine veteran Mac McKinney. Suffering from PTSD and trained to see Muslims as the enemy, he made plans to blow up the Islamic center of Muncie, Indiana. In this brainwave session at the Rubin, Mac McKinney is on stage with one of the leaders of the Islamic center he sought to destroy. Bibi Bahrami. They're joined by filmmaker Joshua Seftel and the emotions researcher and neuroscientist Tracy Dennis Tawari. So there's so much richness in, in this film, and you know, I'm an emotion scientist, so you know I have a certain <laughs> bent when I think about this, but what fascinates me uh, is that as the theme of Brainwave is that emotions uh, from either a Buddhist or a scientific, perspe uh, scientific perspective um, are energy. And like any energy, they have to go someplace. And like any energy, they can be transformed. And the notion of a klesha, which is a state that clouds the mind, and these difficult emotions that we have are sort of prime, prime examples of kleshas is that they're, they're always double-edged swords. So as Tim was alluding to, there's always a flip side. And anger is one of the big ones. And so as I was watching this film and thinking about the transformation of anger, I noticed something about Mac and Bibi. And Bibi, I feel that you and Mac are sort of two sides of a coin. You both experienced this incredible trauma of war. And and you had to say, this was, this was the experience. You sort of, it's sort of like the improv technique. You said, yes, this is the experience. And then what? And, and then your paths maybe diverged before they came together. And so what I was really interested in, Bibi, was um, as I thought about your experiences, and then you came to the States, and as the story unfolded, and then when you found out about Mac's plans, you invited him to dinner. And that, that was your, you know, and so I'm thinking, where is, where is Bibi's anger? Where is, I got to have a sense of you, like, oh, that's very Bibi of her. He, he says he's going to blow up the mosque and she invites him to dinner. But um, where was your anger in this story, in your personal journey? How did that show up for you? I mean, I mean, all human, we are all human beings, we are weak human beings, we all have angers, we all have strength and weaknesses. And I've been blessed with one of the strength, the patient and understanding. Mm -hmm. And I think that helps me. And I, like after 9-11 happened, for example, I was upset, I was angry, came from university and my parents were crying. They were in my house visiting in the United States. And I was all upset, I threw my books and I said, what is this? This is like how many times that my family have to migrate and so many loss. And I think that's how I, like, I dealt with it to do something about it. I stopped watching television since after 9-11. Mm -hmm. I said, no, I'm not gonna watch this and cry about it. I want to do something about it. Mm -hmm. I think that helps with my anger, taking actions, a positive directions, instead of just crying and fussing or complaining about it. I don't like to complain about something mm -hmm. unless I can do something about you're, it. You're yeah. And you know, that's actually very scientific of you because uh, emotion scientists, starting with Darwin, by the way, a third of evolutionary theory is about emotion. His third book, it was called The Expression of Emotion in Man and Animals. It's very you know, exciting reading. If wow. I, had. <laughs> but I like reading, to read but, it, um, yeah, sure. But the idea here is that mm. emotions are information about where you mm -hmm. stand in the world and preparation. Okay. So they prepare our minds and bodies Absolutely. to act so that anger, the information is that we have something in this world that's blocked. Yeah. We want it. 
And it can be a material goal, it can be a spiritual goal, it can be a value, but there's an obstacle. And so what it prepares you to do, that anger, is to overcome that obstacle. Yes. And so what you've done so beautifully and in your not-for-profit mm -hmm. work, which I'd love to hear about more as well, mm -hmm. is you, you take that and, it, and I think it makes you go like, <laughs> non-stop is my impression. Yes, it is, absolutely. I think that's what I said in my positive energy, taking action and everything I see, I take action. I say, if I could make a difference, I will non-stop sleeping for 10 years. If I can make a better world, that's yes. my feeling. But if I couldn't do that, at least I wanted to go back and serve those people in my community that I left behind, those girls, yeah. in my local community. And I think this is the way I overcome my angers or my gossip just talking about it. I would like to do something. So that was injustice for you, the, it was the, injustice. I and when we so. spoke before, you mentioned a few times this, these, I'm thinking of the people left behind. Left behind, yeah, exactly. And um, you know that actually makes me think of, of Josh. What we were talking about at another on another day about why you make these films, um, focusing on on the Muslim community. Yeah. That there's you called it this Trojan horse of anger, mm. underneath this this beautiful film. And and so I'm feeling that there's a connection here. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about. So. Uh, after 9-11, I saw my Muslim friends mm -hmm. facing hatred and, and I related to it because when I was growing up in upstate New York, I faced anti-Semitism and name calling and kids calling me Jew kike and throwing pennies at me to remind me that Jews are cheap and someone threw a rock the size of a brick through the front window of our home and those memories stayed with me. and I connected with my Muslim friends after 9-11. And so I decided to try to make films for, that would tell stories of American Muslims and give a platform to them to share their stories in a way that I thought was more accurate uh, portrayal. Mm -hmm. And so this, this film is the, um, the 25th film that we made over the last eight years. And, and then we have the other side of that coin I was talking about, Mac. And, um, and you know, there's so many questions that I'm sure people ask you. And, and one thing I, I wondered if you've been asked or have thought about, it's so clear that it was in community that healing happened. And that this transformation of maybe some fear, uncertainty into love towards you and uh, that deep acceptance was transformative. But what do you think inside you, what was it about you that allowed you to receive that feeling? Someone who was fresh off a, a huge 25 years in the military where you probably experienced some things that none of us can even imagine. So the thing was is that actually knowing that my daughter had been around another Muslim had angered me, very much so. I went there with the intent, knowing that what I was going to do, you know, I, I, I can tell you, you know, the bomb, I was done. Bomb was built. Just a matter of timing now, right? When I wanted to do it. Uh, my daughter, I had anger. I knew these people were evil people. I knew it. She didn't. So I went there to find the proof that I could give her tangible proof that these people are evil. The crazy thing was I found love and understanding. Total surprise. Well, I think it's a couple things. Uh, number one, and I, I've never admitted to this, but in, in a lot of ways, my hatred left me vulnerable. Um, it, that may take a little bit of explaining, but, but I, do, I do believe that my hatred left me vulnerable to take something else in, maybe, hmm. or to replace something. Um, B.B. Sun Zaki, I think, really, he hit that nail on the head. And I didn't even think about that until after I saw the film and heard what he said, is that I was looking for something because what I had was gone. I was looking for something to replace it, something bigger than myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
And there was a moment in the, in the doc where you talked about, as you were making these plans and you felt close to carrying them out, that you said, you know, I just wanted it all to stop. I wanted the voices to stop. I wanted the pain to stop. And the thing about this energy of emotions, these powerful, painful, destructive emotions, is that it has to go someplace. And when our impulse is to squash it, avoid it, make it stop, that's when it becomes, that's when it explodes. That's when it, and, and so, the, so there was that moment where you could have just acted out of a desire to numb yourself. Mm -hmm. And you didn't. And that, for me, was a really fascinating pivot point. In, your, in, in that story? Well, I was, I was looking to make a, I guess a uh, spectacular event happen. And so just doing it like that, it's not gonna work. It's not what I want. Mm -hmm. I want the show, you know, I want them all there. I wanna, I, I wanna watch it explode. I, I, I wanna get caught, I wanna have my day in court. And then, you know, I guess lie on the table and say, I did it my way. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I know that sounds kind of cynical, but in, in, in all actuality, it was like I took my time in doing all of this because I wanted it done right. Mm -hmm. And because I acted alone. Mm -hmm. Nobody knew, you know. Yeah. I, I used to say that I'm, I was like most husbands, I don't tell my wife nothing. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't know. She didn't know. An interesting thing about um, this happening, not just in the context of um, a story of war, a story of, you know, 9-11 changed everything for so many of us. So we have these transition points, we have these passageways we're going through. So, and you came out of war into this new war at home, and there, was, there were these transitions. You went through this incredible trauma of having to live in a refugee camp. Of having of seeing people suffer and die, and then coming, and there are these passageways, these you know, and and when we, and that's transformation as well. What was it? What is it in some of these teachings, Mac, that drew you, and and Bibi, that you have, that give meaning to your life, that you think allow you to us to navigate these points in our life yeah. when you can go one way or the other and we maybe we have faith maybe we have other beliefs i would say i mean for me personally as growing up with a very strong religious family and uh, always do the right things and serving your neighbors i mean i see the all the religions that i have studied about and we have i'm also co-founder of interfaith for the last 15 years and I choose a topic that then seems like we're all repeating ourselves, like whatever topic I choose, and it all stands for just and understanding and uh, take care of your neighbors. And I think that's what my faith was very strong in still in me, and then kind of like understanding how to take care of situation when things happen, mm -hmm. when there is a need, what to do about it. And I think that was the draw that I had to help in a dire situation. And the notion of guests having, a, welcoming a guest and That's, having, sal and having, and saying salam and saying there's peace and peace. safety, it's, that is built into, the, and that, that sounds exactly. very interesting. And I wonder what your, you know, what your experience of that was, Mac, and, and what you made of that. Well, I think, of course, without saying so, you, it, it was confusing at first, uh, but <clears throat> the, the more I, I delve into reading the Quran and, and getting to know uh, or getting to know the people, I saw these words in their book put into action. Mm -hmm. Hadn't had a lot of experience like that. And I'm not saying that all Muslims are like that. I'm you know, we you know, just like any other religion we have we have prob our problem children too, you know. <laughs> it happens. Um, but luckily the community that I was associated with, that I got introduced to, ended up acting on those words mm -hmm. from what it said. And it's like, man, I was wrong. Yeah. I was mm -hmm. so wrong. We think about this yeah. transformation, oh sorry, really briefly, as, as something so internal, but everything about this story is about the, so, the context, the community of how this change happens. Yes. 
And I think when we think about spirituality or you know, uh, working with our emotions, and you know, I know you're, you're a coach, Mac, and you work with people and clients to help them through these processes. Mm -hmm. we, in, in, the, in the West and how I was educated as a psychologist, we think of it as so internal. And I feel that we've forgotten this other piece, that emotion is never in a vacuum. It's completely contextualized that these traumas and challenges are as well, as well as our hope and our our, our uh, possibility for change. And I just wonder if you, th you know, what, what you, uh, either any of you think of that notion and maybe how it works into other, whether, you know, and whether someone is a Muslim or not, or of the faith or not, or how do we bring that notion into our lives no matter where we are on, on the path? I believe that, yeah. I believe that the actual theology that you subscribe to is not what the important thing is. And I say that because regardless of that theology, regardless of that doctrine, if you're not living up to it, what are you doing? Just reading books? I mean, you know, and, and that's what it comes down to. It's a matter of, and like I tell a lot of Muslims, don't tell people about Islam, show them. You know. Yeah, you kind of have to live it and show it by your action. Your act is a act of kindness. I mean, like the Prophet, peace be and blessing be upon him, like we have said peace on all of the Prophets. I mean, like example of him was when we went to pilgrimage that he, one of the ladies was throwing, every time he go to the prayer, throwing rocks at him to bother him every morning or every <laughs> prayer he was going. And then the one day that he did not, uh, nobody threw rocks at him. And he was concerned that something has happened to this lady. He went and visited this lady. And that lady was That sounds saying, like you inviting Mac to dinner. Huh? Exactly. That's what I was just thinking exactly. about. That example came to me. I said, well, I was really inspired by that. I said, you know, this is, a, we have to live it, not just to say, oh, this religion is good or that religion is good. It's uh, our spiritual human being taking care of each other and the kindness, I think that's what helps a lot. Those are examples mm -hmm. for us. Mm -hmm. We have to follow, but- It's we, a map for action. It's a map for action, yeah, yes, yeah. exactly. Well, maybe he's like a ninja of, of emotion, as <laughs> yeah. you know, he's like this. But what if we thought about all negative emotions like that? What if we actually thought that when we feel them, we're not broken, mm. we're not bad, it's an opportunity? Opportunity. Mm. Yeah. What if we that, thought? What if we did that, that all the time? Yeah. What would happen? Yeah. We will never get over emotions like hatred. I told people that we can, we will always have hatred in the world. We have to because if you have bad, you have you have to have good, and if you have good, you have to have bad, right? I hate lima beans and the New England Patriots. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> And, and it makes this other point that if you, you own it, it's part of you, you really have no choice. Like suppressing or eradicating or avoiding it, it's just not an option. No. Nope. It's, it's simply not. And when you said a little while back, you said, I think that, that hatred, that anger made me vulnerable, which was a good thing that opened me to change. Mm -hmm. I, think this is, I think this is profoundly important. Mm -hmm. That's what you said when you first saw him. You, you said, you told me, I was like, why, like, why, why did you let him in? Why, why didn't you like push him away? <laughs> yeah. And you said, because he was vulnerable. Yeah, yeah. And you, I think you said he was shaking. I mean, it, yeah. and you, 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 you knew that you could help him. Yes, absolutely. When I met him first in the Islamic Center and just looking at him and uh, because he had come once before and I could just see that, you know, as I said, he mentioned that my son said he's looking for something bigger. I mean, I've been blessed my husband as a medical practice. I have worked in his office and I have taken care of people in the refugee camp and local community. Uh, the experience, just to know those individuals who, as I say, I have a special connection with those people. When I saw him, I just like, I just felt like, not to disrespect him, to just like, I mean, I know in Islamic culture we don't hug men, you know, like I just wanted to give him a hug and comfort me. My hugging, I love my hugs and comforting. 
but uh, with words and kindness and respect to who he is, I think that was the way I showed the comfort, yes. And so these beliefs about what you do with these, 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 these personalities, whether it's someone in the airport or someone that kind of frightens you that's come to your mm -hmm. place, the beliefs that we have about what we do with that, this, it's a primary blocker to knowing what to do next. And we're coming back to the idea of the Mandala Lab and these, and the, and the, um, you know, the yantra, the, the, you know, this sort of the vehicle. It's called vahana in Buddhism and uh, Hinduism, and it's this idea that if you know the iconography of some of the Buddhist and, and Hindu figures, they're they're often riding a little creature. So uh, Ganesha, and you might have seen that beautiful Ganesha in the entryway, the, the elephant uh, god. Uh, he's riding this tiny little mouse, and the mouse represents you know many positive traits, but also represents a busy mind, like a rat scurrying around. And so at the same time that it's that the mouse is fortitude and loyalty and all these other things, it's also this other thing. And so the transformation comes in that acceptance of both. And then you can do something with it. So That's it seems to me that everything we're talking about, about what went right, and how you both are expressing this, there are this, these two sides of this coin, it seems the like point. there's something that's fundamental about that. Yes. Yeah, I think it was. And th these guys are friends. <laughs> Which is pretty cool, I think. I think there's yeah. a little br a little brother, big sister vibe yes. going on. Did yes. I? Uh, did I? I mean, they've been tra <laughs> they've been traveling with this film, and you know, when when we make the travel arrangements, Mac is always like, I want make sure I sit next to BB because I'm I want to take care of her, I want to protect her, and uh, you know, a few weeks ago, Mac got married, and congratulations, uh, <laughs> and of course. You know, BB catered the wedding, <laughs> and um, and Sa yeah. Sa Saba, her husband, officiated the wedding. I would expect so, nothing yeah. less. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the thing is, I also uh, when he became the president, I said, I will help you and do the work. There was time I was angry at him and I was mad at him. I said, Brother Rick, you cannot do that. Can't say that. <laughs> He was telling me, like, I have a wife at home. I don't need my sister to lecture uh, to lecture you. <laughs> you know, I actually want to bring, this was an issue that, <laughs> you guys are cute. Um, I wanted to bring up something that was kind of in the back of my mind as I watched this, and I watched it three or four times. I just, I loved it, and I cried my way. Oh my God, Josh, the first time I watched this film, I was just, like, bawling. The end. It was so moving and touching, yeah. so I will say that. You know, kudos for making me cry, you know, yes. making me cry, so. But I was thinking, um, as a woman, and our relationship to anger, yeah. it's very complicated. Yes. And as a man, <laughs> and your relationship to vulnerability, it's very complicated. And I wonder yes. if you could very speak a little <laughs> bit about, about those mm, stories we tell ourselves as men and women in, in, in the world, and as people in the world. <laughs> <laughs> We talk about it because he's, she's talking about the woman. You know, we have different emotions, we have different oh, anger, we have different <laughs> excuses. <laughs> Brother, uh, you don't have those excuses that what we have. You're not that privileged, okay? But you guys have your own. I will talk about mine, how to overcome those, and see it, the positive side of it. And it doesn't last too long. As the minute, what I try to tell people, like when you decide, like it's amazingly the mind over body thing, you know, the simple psychology. So when you decide with yourself, like somebody, I see Julie sitting in front of me. And I say, like, if there's some mind comes to me, like, oh, like, I don't do this. this I'm so blessed. Like, it cannot say, like, oh, this person did this or that. I, I'm not that kind of person. I, I have seen it from other people. I hear it all the time and I see it. Instead of that, if that comes to your mind, instead of just making that look or saying something, just immediately, internally, I make a prayers. Mm -hmm. Immediately. Or the guidance, I want a guidance for that person if they acted wrong. And that immediately puts me in a better peace. Mm -hmm. That and reminds about, me that, that I do this meditation app and they, they teach me that where it's like, First, they make you imagine someone you love, 
and send them good wishes. And then they make you imagine, think of someone you don't like, mm -hmm. and then send them good wishes. Good wishes. And yes. it's really hard to do, but it's it's. I do like it. That's, yeah. I, I, I always do it. Yeah. Yes, I, I'm blessed to be able to do that. <laughs> okay, uh, men and vulnerability. This is something we definitely don't want to talk about. Right? <laughs> That's right? why I asked, man. Yeah. I want to hear more. Yeah, uh, men are more concerned with looking tough. Not being tough, because there's always somebody tougher, but looking tough. Looking up to in a way that you can respect them for their manliness. You know, that whole cheese mode scenario. But in pursuing that, we also become vulnerable because we become vulnerable to the people who don't feel that way about us. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's kind of like it's kind of like somebody who wants everybody to like them. Well, that's never going to happen. There's always going to be somebody that doesn't like you. Even me, I'm a nice guy. <laughs> Happens. Somebody is always going to look at you. Like you're not a, that tough guy. I got over it because mm -hmm. I had already, I, I had said I have nothing to prove to be a tough guy. Mm -hmm. Been there, done that, retired. Retired from the <laughs> tough guy racket. Yeah. No, that's probably... So no, and you you know you I wonder if that's still. Do you feel that this has changed for younger men? Because there's talk that it might have. Um, you work with some younger people in your practice, and I just wonder what you think about that, the generational shift or lack of shift. Well, I think now it's not as prevalent. This is just my own personal feelings. I am no way an expert in this. But I, I think my generation, that was more of a generalized statement where it, it, encompassed, it, it encompassed more people. Nowadays, it's not so much because we have a lot of individuals mm. in the world. I have some clients that just rather just be alone and give them a book, they're good. But then I have these other clients that have to be the person that people will back down from. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I tell them, I says, you know, you can think that all you want to, but trust me, I've learned. <laughs> Somebody will knock you down. It happens. So it's just, um, I think it's more case by case than it is generalized yeah. now. Um, I think a lot about youth mental health. Um, and, um, and I think about the, the different world in which kids are growing up. It's, some things are the same, but there's much that's different. And, 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 you know, Mac, I'm also, as, you, as someone who works with young people, as well as the full range as well, if both of you have thoughts on what we need to do now to support our kids mm. in um, grappling with really what I think is the crisis right now for many of our kids, which is that they have difficult emotions, they have difficult experiences. I wonder if they feel less able to transform them, to know what to do with them. Or maybe not, maybe they're having more conversations that are helpful. I, you know, I think it's a, a real turning point right now. And I wonder if you have some thoughts on youth mental health and how we can support our kids. Sister first. <laughs> Sister first, okay. I mean, uh, I'm not that knowledgeable. I think you can have the knowledge there. I will just give you my personal experience. I've been total blessed with six children. Uh, I serve on the advisory board for the school, and the principal, they always ask me, what do you teach your children? I would like to have my, uh, uh, have my advice and give her the, my input that everybody loved my children in school. I wish I had my room full of these children. I'd say I'm totally blessed. I mean, I get, make my children part of my everyday life. I give them importance, I respect them, I respect their opinion, and I do reverse psychology with them, and <laughs> that, that helps too. And I think that respect starts from very young age. And please respect and that confidence, that uh, insecurity, and understanding to the human needs. But I advise 
that to raise the, our beautiful children in this world to be ready for education and give them opportunity and study and even give advice to the school board when I was an advisory board that teach these children in the beginning, don't wait till they go to college. I think that will be my advice for my future. I'll bring in this concept from um, uh, psychology called emotion regulation. And it's this um, idea that we, you know, we modify our emotions, we increase them, we decrease, decrease them. That's the job. That's, a, you know, that's when we are developing kids, when we're adults, we need to learn to control our emotions. But one thing um, that we're, we're only beginning to learn more about is how we use one emotion to regulate another emotion. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, so to actually, it's this, you know, bringing up the ninja again of, emo you know, the thing with emotions is that they require agility. Um, and, and so this idea of using one emotion or of, you know, of this completely integrated, you know, mandala where ignorance is at the center and these emotions and experiences are intersecting. I think that's, um, that's another place where the spiritual practice and, you know, 20, 21st century science come together in very interesting ways. Yes.